Hi, uh, my name is Asaf Sadon. Uh, today I'm going to talk about techniques that control the frequency of data loss in cloud storage systems. Um, this is joint work with uh, Steve Rumble, Ryan Stutzman, Sachin Khadi, John Ousterhout, and Mendel Rosenblum, and we're all from Stanford. So, um, as most of you know, cloud storage systems typically spray their data across thousands of commodity servers. Now, when you have thousands of servers, um, these servers die um, periodically, and um, there's a pretty high chance that you'll need to deal with these, um, with, with these uh, node failures. So one of the main goals of uh, data center storage systems is to tolerate node failures. Now, the common you know, approach taken by almost all um, uh, popular um, cloud storage systems is to randomly spray your data on three machines on different racks. Um, and this you know, prominently is used by Hadoop file system, Google file system, Windows, Azure, and also um, by RAM Cloud, which is a system we're developing at Stanford. Now, this technique is actually very durable when you're talking about kind of independent node failures. So if you have a single machine failure, uh, disk failures, or even entire rack failures, um, basically this, this technique kind of ensures that almost very low probability of, of losing any data. Um, however, unfortunately, not all uh, node failures are independent, um, and correlated failures are quite frequent in cloud storage systems. And when I say correlated failures, what I mean is um, a number of nodes failing at the same time or unavailable for a large period of time. And these correlated failures uh, are caused by uh, various uh, different uh, effects. So for one, when you have a cluster-wide power outage, typically 1% um, of the nodes, in, at least commodity nodes, in a data center do not um, come back up. Um, you can also have uh, large-scale network failures that would affect a large portion of your cluster. Um, and you can have uh, software bugs. And there's even, you know, uh, instances when you lose access to several nodes at the same time because you want to actually power down several nodes at the same time. So for example, if you're running a rolling software hardware upgrade or if you actually just want to power down part of your cluster, you're going to have a situation where some of your nodes are unavailable at the same time. And so in this talk, um, we'll focus on one particular type of failure, namely power outages. Uh, that, that is when uh, about 1% of the nodes um, do not reboot properly, and you, can a, you cannot access their data, at least for a, a long period of the time. Um, however, the same techniques and concepts that we introduced in this talk can be applied to any type of correlated failure. Now, what this graph shows, it shows the probability of losing all copies of at least one data chunk on, in the entire cluster on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, um, we plot the number of nodes in your cluster. And we did this for, we computed um, these probabilities for two systems, um, Hadoop File System and RAM Cloud, both using a random replication. Now, as you can see, once your cluster scales beyond a couple hundred nodes, you're basically guaranteed to lose data under this scenario. And this effect has actually been confirmed uh, by several companies. So um, Facebook, Yahoo, LinkedIn, and, and several others have actually noted that every time they kind of have a power outage, they basically lose access to data. Um, and so what we'll do in this talk is actually focus on this problem and try to see how we can um, reduce these probabilities in different scenarios without impacting the performance of the system. So before we do that, let me just explain why um, these systems are so amenable to losing data under correlated failures. And so uh, as, as a kind of an example, let's take a cluster of nine nodes. So node number one uh, replicates a chunk, and it chooses two other nodes at random from the cluster. So it chooses nodes number five and six to store its data. Now, from the perspective of a single chunk, the only way we'll lose data is if nodes one, five, and six fail at the same time. So let's add another chunk. Uh, now node number two replicates one of its chunks. It replicates at random to nodes six and eight. And so again, the only way we will lose data um, is either if nodes one, five, and six fail at the same time, or if nodes two, six, and eight fail at the same time. Now, um, yeah, I'll introduce a key concept um, of our paper now, um, which is copy sets. And what a copy set is, it's a set of nodes that contain all copies of a chunk. So in this case, nodes 1, 5, and 6 are a copy set, and nodes 2, 6, and 8 are a copy set. 
Now a copy set is in essence, it represents a unit of failure. Basically, if you lose a copy set, you lose data. That's the basic idea. So now with random replication, um, in, in these clusters, what happens is each node has 10,000 chunks or more. And so you're going to continuously replicate onto more and more and more nodes and kind of spray your data across the cluster. And what happens is as you replicate more, you create more and more copy sets or more and more units of failure. So eventually, um, if you have enough data, basically any combination of three nodes in your cluster is going to cause data loss. And that's the basic idea, and that's why random replication loses data at such a high probability. And so if we kind of look at the math, um, so what, what happens is basically random replication creates more and more copy sets until it eventually creates the maximum number of copy sets, which is all combinations of three nodes in the cluster. So in a cluster of nine nodes, that's nine choose three, which is 84. And then let's take a scenario where three of our nodes, three random nodes, fail at the same time the probability of losing data is going to be the number of units of failure, or the number of copy sets, divided by the overall number of combinations of three nodes. In this case, it's 84 divided by 84, which is 100% probability of data loss. OK, so that's kind of uh, one end of the spectrum. What if we wanted to minimize completely um, the copy sets or the units of failure and make um, uh, data loss very, very rare? So here's one approach we could take which we call min copy sets. And in this approach, we basically split nodes into groups of three. Um, so for example, nodes one, five, and seven are kind of in the same group. And so every time one of the nodes in that group wants to replicate, it will deterministically always replicate onto the two other nodes. So for example, if node five is going to replicate one of its chunks, it's always going to place them on nodes one and seven. And same thing for nodes two, four, nine, and three, six, and eight. And so now what we did here, we basically constrained the replication of each node into a single copy set. And we kind of limited the number of copy sets that the system generates. In effect, this is like disk mirroring, right? You're basically creating identical um, uh, copies of, of nodes. Now, in this scenario, the only way we'll lose data, as I said earlier, is if one of the copy set fails simultaneously. So if nodes 1, 5, and 7 die, we will lose data. But in this case, we'll lose all of the nodes' data, right? So we'll lose actually much more data than before, but data loss will be much rarer. So if we look at the math, again, we only created three copy sets. And then if three random nodes from our cluster fail at the same time, the probability that we will hit that exact copy set is going to be only 3 divided by 85, which is 3.5%. And in other words, much, much smaller than 100%. Now, if we plot this scheme and kind of you know, apply it to a large cluster um, and, and plot it on this graph, it's basically the, the exact opposite of random replication, right? You're going to get very close to zero probability of data loss under this um, correlated failure uh, scenario of, of a power outage. Um, and you kind of you know, basically reduce um, your probability of data loss to the bare minimum. So what we're doing here in practice, as I said earlier, it's a trade-off, right? We're making data loss much more rare, but in exchange, every time we lose data, we lose more data or lose access to more data. So in this table we plotted uh, for a 5,000-node cluster, um, the mean time to failure and the amount of data loss um, for min copy sets and for random replication, given kind of a tongue-in-cheek scenario that a power outage occurs every single year. So in that case, with random replication, we're basically going to lose data every single year, year, which is kind of what these data center operators are seeing today. But each time we lose data, we'll lose kind of a handful of chunks. On the other hand, with min copy sets, you'll lose data very rarely, so every 625 years, but then you'll lose an entire node's worth of data. Now, the motivation for this trade-off is that many data center operators, not all, but many, would actually prefer to minimize the occurrence of any data loss. And the reason is that each time and you have an incident of data loss, you're basically going to have to find, locate that data, you need to recover it, um, and, and there's kind of a set of fixed costs uh, associated with that data loss event um, that, that you might want to minimize. And so this, this kind of idea is actually, you know, several uh, system implementers have told us that they would prefer this um, trade-off, and it would actually save them a lot of cost and time. 
Now, the main problem with this min copy set scheme that I presented is that it, it, it has a very bad effect on node recovery time. So um, with random replication, you're kind of spreading your data across the entire cluster. And what this gives you is that if any of your nodes die, you can actually recover it, that node's data from basically all of the nodes in the cluster at the same time. So we plotted here the time to recover um, a 100 uh, gig node in a 39 node HDFS cluster that we ran in Stanford. And as you can see, random replication recovers much, much faster than min copy sets, because in min copy sets, you only have two other nodes to recover your data from. So it, because of this exact issue, um, Facebook um, implemented an extension to HDFS that is kind of a compromise approach. And let me just explain what they did. So, Instead of replicating each chunk and choosing ra random machines across the entire cluster, what they did, they chose a random machine, but from a smaller subset of nodes, which they call a buddy group. So basically, they take a window of 10 nodes um, from each that, around each node, and they only replicate the two other copies of the chunk uh, to that window. Now let's see how uh, this scheme performs in terms of recovery time. So it's much closer um, to random replication in terms of recovery time um, it, it, because you have 10 nodes that you can read um, your data from. In terms of the probability of data loss, it's, again, it's kind of a compromise, right? So it does much better than um, just random replication at large, um, but it's still a lot worse than min copy sets. So if we take kind of a data point of, let's say we have a 5,000 node cluster, which is a fairly normal um, HDFS cluster, you're going to lose data at around 25% you know, of the time when these types of events occur, which is OK. But the question is, can we do better, right? And so the main question we ask in the paper is, can we take that green bar over there and basically lower it to close to 0 while still having the same recovery time that we had for that green bar, having the same recovery time as before? And the answer is yes, and, and that scheme is called copy set replication. So before I just go into that scheme, I'll introduce another concept important to, to understanding um, these replication systems, which we call scatter width. And what scatter width means, scatter width is basically the number of nodes you can recover from in case of a, of, of a node failure. So in the case of min copy sets, a node, each node replicates its data to two other nodes. And therefore, if that node dies, it can only recover from two other nodes. And therefore, its scatter width is two. For fa the Facebook extension to HDFS, you replicate each node onto a buddy group of 10 other nodes. And therefore, you can recover from those 10 other nodes. And the scatter width is 10. Now, let's see how, given a scatter width, how many copy sets the Facebook extension uh, scheme generates. So let's take, as, as an example, um, a nine node cluster again. And this time, we're taking a scatter width of four. So every, we want every node to be able to recover from, to rec we want to be able to recover its data from four other nodes in the cluster. So for example, let's say node number one replicates uh, randomly across a group of four other nodes, nodes two to five. So in terms of copy sets, uh, node number one is basically going to generate every combination of three nodes that includes node number one, and then uh, any combination of nodes two, and two to five. So it'll be one, two, three, one, two, four, one, two, five, et cetera. If you count the overall number of copy sets generated by this scheme in, in a cluster of nine nodes, you will reach 54 copy sets. So then if we take our, our original example and say three random nodes fail in this cluster of nine nodes, the probability of losing data or hitting uh, one of these copy sets is going to be 54 divided by 84, 64%. Again, a lot better than 100%, but a lot worse than 3.5%, which is what we got with min copy sets. OK, so let's see how we can do better. Now, let, let's look at the following scheme. Imagine we um, kind of carefully place the chunks um, so that you basically get a much smaller number of copy sets but you still get the same scatter width. So for example, we will, uh, let's say, create the following copy sets, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 1, 4, 7, 2, 5, 8, 3, 6, 9. And what this means is let's say you're node number one, and you want to replicate your data. You will either replicate it on, on one of the copy sets that you are a member of. So you'll either replicate your data on nodes two and three, 
or on nodes four and seven. And then if node number one dies, you'll be able to read its data off from nodes two, three, four, and seven. So you will get a scatter width of four nodes, just as, like before. Now what you'll notice is that it's not, this is not good only for node number one. Any node that you look in, in, in the scheme will be able to get a scatter width of four with, from, from, from the cluster. And we only generated six copy sets. Um, so in terms of the probability of data loss, since we have six copy sets, the probability is going to be 7%, which is, again, orders, an order of magnitude less than 64%. Um, and so how do you generate such schemes? The ingredients to generate them are basically for every, or for every, for, the, for a given scatter width, we're trying to minimize the number of copy sets. Or in other words, every copy set that we add to the scheme should generate a maximum kind of scatter width for the nodes in that copy set. Um, and the way to do that is to generate copy sets that have a minimal number of overlap, meaning every one of the copy sets in this scheme overlaps with every other copy set by no more than one node. And that means that for every node in that copy set, it will get an additional scatter width of two other unique nodes, which it didn't replicate to before. So I, I hope that's clear. And, and let me just show how we use this scheme and apply it to uh, kind of a real uh, data center storage system that, that is very large in a practical setting. Now note that this problem is actually very difficult to solve optimally. Um, in some cases, it's actually impossible to solve optimally. So the scheme I'll present now is kind of an approximation um, to, to this optimal scheme of minimizing the number of copy sets given a set scatter width. And this scheme is called copy set replication. It involves two steps. There's an initialization step, where basically you split nodes into copy sets. And then there's the replication step, which is what, when you actually replicate, which nodes do you replicate to. So in the initialization step, we take all the nodes in our cluster, you know, number them, um, and then we basically randomly or reorder them. You don't have to randomly reorder them. You can actually reorder them in any way you want um, in order to present, preserve kind of your failure domains. But for simplicity, let's just say you randomly reorder your nodes. And then based on that rea uh, random reordering, you split these nodes into copy sets, right? So we just go, you know, three by three and, and take that, that random order and split these nodes into copy sets. Now notice this, this first step that we did is kind of like min copy sets, right? Each node belongs to one copy set, and each node will get a scatter width of two other nodes um, that they'll be able to recover from. And then you repeat this process. So basically, you continuously create more and more permutations, um, kind of randomly reordering your nodes and splitting them into copy sets. And basically, every step along the way, you add to the scatter width of every one of the nodes. Now notice, this scheme will perform very well, or will be close to optimal, when you have a very, when the, the amount of scatter width that you want to achieve is much smaller than the number of nodes. And this is typically true for these systems. So typically these systems have thousands or tens of thousands of nodes, and the scatter width that you really need is, is usually not, you know, 10, 20, um, I mean, you usually don't actually recover from um, the entire cluster in these systems. Finally, on the replication phase, um, so, again, like before, if node number eight, for example, wants to replicate, it will just at random choose one of its copy set, one of the copy sets it belongs to, and replicate to the two other nodes in that copy set. So we'll either replicate in this example to nodes one and eight or to nodes five and six. So that's, it's a pretty simple scheme. Um, and then we implement this scheme on HDFS and RAM Cloud and, uh, um, and showed that it actually has very little overhead. So first, let's take kind of that, that example that we showed before and compare it to the Facebook extension to HDFS, which is basically just randomly replicating across of a smaller group of nodes. So as you'll see, in terms of overhead, it's pretty insignificant. By the way, this overhead would be zero if we had a larger cluster. So it's just an artifact of the fact that we have a very small um, cluster to work with. Um, and as you can see, I mean, in terms of recovery time, it's basically identical. Um, to, to the, uh, the Facebook uh, extension scheme. Now, in terms of the probability of data loss, which is kind of the main, uh, the main figure of, of, of this talk, as you can see, we basically drop the probability of data loss close to zero. Um, so you need to compare in this graph the green line and the pink line um, at the bottom. 
So basically, we take the green line um, and with exactly the same performance, um, ex pretty, the, exactly the same recovery time, basically reduce the probability of data loss under this correlated uh, failure event to close to zero. Um, and just because we constrained uh, uh, in, in a much more careful way which copies, the number of copies that, that the scheme generates. Um, finally, just uh, one last thing I'd like to talk about is this scheme is actually uh, a trade-off, right? So um, as when you, if you want to be able to uh, reduce the recovery time for a single node, or in other words, increase your scatter width, you're always going to have to create more and more copy sets. The difference between kind of the random replication scheme and, and copy set replication is that in, when random replication, we're getting, um, we're increasing the probability of data loss at a much higher rate per scatter width that we add than in copy set replication. So with random replication, you're basically getting a cubic increase in the probability of data loss for every scatter width that you add, while in copy set replication, you're getting a close to linear increase. Uh, of the probability of data loss, which is close to optimal. So for the same scatter width, copy set replication is basically always going to give you a much, much lower probability of data loss, which, as I said, is a desired property in many, um, in many cloud storage systems. So finally, just in terms of related work. Um, so this, the, the, these schemes, the, the, the problem of trying to um, minimize um, the number of copy sets for a given scatter width is actually related to a pretty old field in, in, in uh, math uh, that some of you might be familiar with called um, combinatorial design theory and, and um, balanced and complete block designs, um, which are basically um, similar kind of combinatorial designs were, um, that were originally proposed for designing agricultural experiments in the 1930s. And these schemes have actually popped up uh, uh, a few times in, in other contexts um, in computer systems. Um, in terms of other applications, so um, first of all, um, you don't, there's another interesting application of, of power down. So anybody who's ever operated an HDFS cluster will probably tell you that it's kind of impossible to power down power to part of the cluster, and for the exact same reason that, that we're talking about in this paper, which is basically if you power down even a small set, subset of your machines, you're going to lose uh, availability to some data um, because there's going to be at least some cop there's going to be all copies of at least some data in that small part of machines. And so similar people have explored similar ideas that kind of constrain um, the breadth or the scope of replication in order to better power down um, HDFS clusters. And these techniques that we showed in, in this talk can actually be used also. Um, to, to do power downs. Uh, finally, I mean, so people have used these uh, types of block designs in, in various domains. So um, in, in the supercomputing world, um, people use it. It's the, the same problem of minimizing copy sets is actually parallel to the problem of trying to maximize the bandwidth given uh, a limited number of ports. And actually, just now, I've heard that th these ideas have also been used in RAID systems. Um, so it's interesting to find all these links. So just as a summary, um, as I said earlier, predominantly, uh, the predominant form of replication today in storage systems is random replication, which is basically sp spraying your data across a lot of nodes. Um, this may cause you uh, big problems when you have a correlated failure, because you're likely to lose data. And copy set replication is just a way that um, uh, lets you control the frequency of data loss um, and, and completely control it in your cloud storage system. So I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks. Hi, Hi Chris Small. I uh, really like the work, um, but it really bugs me the way you presented it. So <laughs> <clears throat> the, um, you, talk, you, you, you kept using the term data loss. Now, data loss is what happens when you have a RAM cloud, but it doesn't happen when, when data is on disk. And all the examples you gave for system outages, Google, LinkedIn, Yahoo, those are places where they keep the data on disk. So do you, do you have any uh, similar statistics either for RAM cloud or for Facebook where they keep things in RAM and they care about things being in RAM? 
Right. Even in, by the way, even RamCloud is a persistent storage system, so we do keep backups on disk. Um, when, when I say data loss, uh, I, sorry, I bugged you. Uh, the probably the right. If, if you'd only said availability. Exactly. Time, so you yeah, can. I you can. I would have been overjoyed. Right. So we, you can uh, switch, do a, a search and replace uh, for the word loss and availability. Um, I'll just point out that most, almost all these systems also have another, you know, site. So they would have an additional data center, so they can always re reconstitute the data from that extra site. So when I say data loss, it's not really permanent data loss. It's long-term data availability. Um, so. But really nice work. Thanks. Yeah. So um, suppose I was more interested in the expected number of files that are uh, unavailable in a given year instead of the probability that 100% of them survive. What changes? It doesn't change. It's the same answer? It's the same. No. So, I mean, the, the expected, and that's a point that we make kind of in the paper, the expected amount of data that you will lose in the same year for this kind of simple model is going to be exactly the same under random replication or under any of these other schemes, like min copy sets or copy set replication. So the expected data loss is going to be basically the same for correlated failures under these specific scenarios. All we're doing is we're just making these failures a lot more rare. And each time you lose data, you're just going to lose more data. But the multiply of those two is always going to be constant. It's always going to be constant. We, I, I, I even have that graph here somewhere. But, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Cyril Guillot, HGST Research. Um, does your construction uh, extend to a case where the uh, cluster varies in size? So if you slowly add nodes, uh, does it change anything? That's a great question. Um, actually, uh, that's kind of a, a small disadvantage of our scheme right now and part of what we're doing now in our, uh, the future work. Um, the more you, if you add nodes kind of after you did that kind of static initialization phase and then you continuously add nodes, actually the scheme will become a little less optimal as time goes by. Um, so we're now actually working on schemes that, that you know, are more optimal in that sense. But okay, thanks. It's a good question. Yeah. Carlos Malzahn, UC Santa Cruz. Um, a related question, actually, um, or, or comment, is um, I encourage you to look at our crush paper at uh, Supercomputing 06 that actually has the uh, concept of failure domains in its uh, rule language for data placement and replication placement. And I think that would actually provide a solution for adding nodes to a scheme like you has. Okay, okay, I'll be. Happy to discuss it, too. Um, carrying over an argument from hot par the last couple days, this would seem to be a victory of uh, a smart determinism over lazy non-determinism. <laughs> That's a great way to put it, yeah. <laughs> hey, Yosef, really nice talk. So actually, you made it clear that there are some mathematical facts that you cannot change, the expected loss of data. So uh, I'm going to ask you some like question. Assume that you're working for Facebook. Are you willing to, for example, lose suddenly like half of the clients in US, like they don't have access to their accounts, or like every now and then um, only one photo of each user? So basically, what you presented is that, for example, the chances that like people may lose access is what in one year once, but then it happens like half of the clients would lose access. To Facebook. So, what's your feeling? If you want to report to your like manager at Facebook, um, <laughs> well, that, first of all, that's why they keep another site. Um, but I think the it's, it's a good question. I th by, the, by the way, most of these systems aren't used, from what I understand, in like to service your pages necessarily, right? A lot of them are used kind of as backend systems. Um, so, in that context, it seems like you would basically want to lose data less. I don't think. Any of these failures actually affect your your data, your photos when you upload the page. But you get the point. You are losing yeah. a lot when you lose, right? It's like you're gambling. The chances are always the same. Expected value of loss is the same. But when you lose, you lose big. So I'll, I'll quickly. Most many times, you as a kind of an operator, right? You want to operate under an SLA, and so if you're going to be down anyways, um, you might just want to be down fewer times. Um, so that's kind of the impression that we got talking to, to some of these operators. But, but some of these considerations are not pure mathematical considerations, right? Uh, they're kind of operational considerations. So I hope that answered your question. Thanks. Great talk. <laughs> Thanks.
Eight. Oh. Okay, uh, quick, quickly. Yeah, it's not a Shekhar from Palo Alto Research Center. And are you taking care of uh, rack awareness in this replication policy? That's, I, yes. I guess I so, missed that part. Um, yeah, so basically when you do these permutations, you can just kind of generate them in a rack aware way, a way. So you can, that's what we actually did in our implementation. We made sure that two nodes from the same rack won't be in the same copy set, basically. Yeah, because that has impact on the performance, so. Yeah, okay. yeah so you can, you can, it doesn't have to be random. You can deterministically place nodes onto copy sets. You can basically do whatever you want in, in terms of how you split nodes into copy sets, as long as you don't have overlaps between the copy sets. Okay, thank you.